Hello, my name is Terry Johnson. I'm a bioengineering lecturer here at UC Berkeley. Today I'd like to talk about responsible conduct in synthetic biology. Now, why does synthetic biology require its own consideration of responsible conduct? Let's consider what innovations challenge traditional models of biosafety. Gene sequencing is becoming less expensive and faster, meaning that there's a tremendous amount and an increasing amount of genetic information. This genetic information is disseminated on the internet, meaning that it's available both to researchers and the public. Gene synthesis technologies are also becoming faster and less expensive and capable of producing larger and larger segments of genetic material. So information can more easily become actual genetic material. Lastly, the proliferation of BioCAD tools mean that users without the traditional amount of training will be capable of producing genetic material, genetic devices, and potentially participate in synthetic biology. So what must a synthetic biologist consider as the field progresses? Well, we need to remember that information propagates quickly. So what we produce is going to be available to a very large audience. This information can readily be made physical. Given a sequence, it's becoming very easy to order actual genetic material based on that sequence. There are also techniques that are available in the lab that are better and better at taking a sequence and turning it in to DNA. Lastly, emergent behaviors of complex multi-gene systems are not obvious. So as we design more and more complex devices, we need to become better and better at considering how the individual parts of the device are going to interact when they're all together in the same chassis. To be a responsible member of the synthetic biology community, we need to share information responsibly, share materials responsibly, design and build responsibly, and communicate with peers, agencies, and the public responsibly. Let's say that you're asked to share biological information, or you have a choice on whether to publish it or not. Ask yourself the following questions. Could the biological information be dangerous to an incautious user? Does the biological information have significant potential for dual use? If no to both, publish freely. If yes to either, consult with advisory or regulatory agencies before publishing. What about biological materials? Well, the International Gene Synthesis Consortium, which is a group of companies all involved in gene synthesis, have come up with the following guidelines. Screen orders, screen customers, keep records, and report inappropriate orders. Let's use these guidelines as a model for how we should consider sharing biological materials. We should ask ourselves the following questions. Is the material safe with minimal potential for dual use? Does the request come from a lab certified to work responsibly with the material? If somebody asks for a risk group 2 chassis or a virulence factor from a risk group 2 organism, we would want to be sure that they're capable of working at biosafety level 2. Not only capable, but certified. If yes to both of these questions, mail in accordance with your institution's policies and record the transfer. Note that sending biological materials over the mails requires particular rules. So make sure that you know that you're mailing them properly if you choose to do so. If no to either of these questions, consider whether the request should be denied or reported to local or federal law enforcement. Designing genetic devices responsibly can be quite complicated. Some of the questions are easy. Does the device involve any clearly hazardous or select agents? Are you using sequences from risk group 2, 3, or 4 organisms? These are important questions to ask, but they're certainly not the entire story. You also have to consider, are there context-specific risks? And what is your containment strategy? Considering context-specific risks, let's look at an example. This is a payload delivery device. Bacteria generates a payload, 
It also is capable of invading a cell, sensing that it's in a vacuole, initiating self lysis, and the self lysis releases both vacuole lysis proteins and the payload. So it's able to lyse the vacuole and release the payload into the inside of the cell. If we took a look at what this device looks like, we would see this. One of the things we would want to check is what risk group do these sequences come from? And if we did that, we would note that all of these come from risk group 1 organisms, with the exception of invasin, and the proteins in the vacuole lysis device. Considering this, and also considering that invasin and the proteins in the vacuole lysis device come from risk group 2 organisms and are virulence factors, we decided that this device, installed in a harmless chassis, should be treated as a risk group 2 organism. It's important to note that the risk group of the organism that a sequence is from is not the entire story. Let's say, for example, that we're interested in GAP-DH from Mycobacterium tuberculosis, a risk group 3 organism. We build a very simple device, which is simply the GAP-DH from that organism in front of a constitutive promoter. Now that sequence is from a risk group 3 organism, but the device is simply going to produce GAP-DH. This device would be harmless despite the fact that the sequence comes from risk group 3. So it's always important to consider the context of the device. The risk group of the organism that you're getting a sequence from is one thing that you should note, but it's not the entire story. Evaluating context-specific risks can be quite complicated. Here are some questions that will help you when looking at your own designs. Is your chassis organism hazardous? A completely harmless device in a potentially harmful chassis is still potentially harmful. Does your device use existing virulence factors? Use of a virulence factor doesn't necessarily mean that your device is harmful, but it does mean that it should be subjected to extra scrutiny. Does your device mimic the activity of a virulence factor? If, for example, you use protein design and create something that has the exact same activity as an existing virulence factor, you should consider that your device contains something that is as good as a virulence factor. Does your device enable the dissemination of genetic material? Being able to pass genetic material from one cell to another presents unique health and environmental safety risks. So these devices should be considered perhaps for containment devices, which we'll discuss in a few moments. Can a mutation of your device result in a dangerous organism? Whenever you build, it's often useful to break various parts of the device and see what happens. This is a good stress test. Take your device and consider what would happen if this part of the device should fail, or another part of the device should fail. The failures of the device should, hopefully, not result in a dangerous organism. If they do, consider the possibility that this may happen. Finally, does your device present any novel risks? We've told you about some of the risks that we commonly look at and know of already, but you may be creating a device that presents risks that we haven't been previously considered. In this case, it's your responsibility, as synthetic biologists, to take these into account. When evaluating a particular risk, you may find it useful to use a risk matrix, as shown here. On one axis, you have the consequence of an adverse event. On the other axis, you have the likelihood of the adverse event. So for example, a minor adverse event that is remote or unlikely, green, is possibly acceptable. On the other hand, a minor event that is likely or very likely is less acceptable, yellow. You may want to go back to the drawing board to see if you can mitigate this risk. A severe adverse event that is likely or very likely is red, completely unacceptable and a severe event that is unlikely or remote is still yellow. You may want to go back to the drawing board and see if you can mitigate these risks. This is not the only way to think about risk, but you may find it useful. Containment strategies are strategies that a synthetic biologist can use to prevent their constructs from escaping the lab. Let's say you want to use a dependent chassis. This could be a chassis that's incapable of necessary synthesis. You install your device 
into a chassis organism that is no longer capable of producing something that it needs to survive. In the lab, with media supplemented with that something, the chassis is fine. Outside of the lab, the chassis is unable to survive. And there are examples of this that are commonly used. Likewise, you can use a chassis that's incapable of necessary transport, for example, by knocking out high affinity iron transport. The cells in the lab are fine. Cells in the environment incapable of that necessary function will not survive. There are other options, such as safeguard devices, and these are devices that are deliberately installed, say, for example, induced lethality devices, commonly called kill switches, or gene flow barriers that prevent the transmission from genetic material from one organism to another. There are also many other devices in development, and this is an area of active research. Lastly, I'd like to talk about communicating responsibly. As a synthetic biologist, you have a responsibility to engage with other synthetic biologists, typically publishing and presenting, but also just being a member of the community. You also have to be a conscientious representative of the field. When discussing synthetic biology with the public or the press, you have to remember that you are a representative of a larger community. It's also important to engage in outreach so that you are part of the training of the next generation of synthetic biologists. So in conclusion, we'd like you to be aware of challenges to traditional models of biosafety, best practices for sharing genetic information and materials, and to consider how to evaluate and minimize risk in your projects and your responsibilities as a member of the synthetic biology community.